present tonight's speaker, John Carr, PulseCast, Whole Home Audio with Pulse Audio and Raspberry Pi. Right. Thank you. Can everybody hear me or do I need to figure out the microphone? No, you're good. You're good. Good. Excellent. So, a couple months ago, a bunch of you may remember me asking some questions on the mailing list about a problem I was trying to solve. And with a lot of effort and difficulty, I found that the solution was actually ridiculously sim simple, but not that easy to find somebody saying, this is the answer that you're looking for. So I'm going to give it to you. <coughs> so we have an agenda, problem, and the solution, which is the Linux sound architecture, and my cookbook, for building a solution. The problem I have is having a bunch of stereos and wanting the same thing coming out of all of them when I've got Ethernet all over the house. <coughs> and you'll have to excuse me. Um, the, I have a seasonal cough. So I may have to stop and take cough drops periodically. Oh. Now, this is a problem that I believe has been solved in many ways. In fact, I was aware of quite a few of them, but them not being the solution I wanted. So previously, I solved the problem by saving a playlist to a file, feeding it to EasyStream which would then create an ice cast stream, which I could then put a laptop or a tablet on each of my stereos, open a browser, and start the thing playing. This is a pretty annoying solution because anytime I wanted to change anything about the playlist, I had to stop EasyStream, save a new version of the playlist, start EasyStream, and then restart the streams. So a friend of mine suggested I look at Chromecast Audio. The great thing about them is they are really cheap. They're like 30 <laughs> bucks a pop. The audio Chromecast is a little different than the regular Chromecast. It only has audio out. Uh, is that an eight inch line level? Yeah, it's got basically a headphone jack out and it's got a proprietary version of a Toslink cable, which means that the first time you go into Best Buy and ask for a Toslink cable from <laughs> Chromecast, the sales guy doesn't know that. He gives you the wrong Toslink cable because you need a special Toslink cable that, as far as I know, is only used by Chromecast. Toslink cables in the audio world are kind of an older standard, like a serial port. Like, everything that's high-end audio has it, <coughs> But most of the newer components are using different interfaces. But they're still around because they've been around forever and everything kind of has them. So if you have a good AV receiver, you can use the DAC in your AV receiver with, toss, with the Toslink cable. And it will sound better than the DAC in the Chromecast. What's a DAC? That's a digital to analog converter. So everything that takes digital input and makes audio output, has some form of DAC in it. And we could do a whole hour discussing DACs, and Keith knows that. Uh -huh. yep. <laughs> He's an audio guy. We have room in April. Are you really? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, maybe uh, yeah, Keith and I, if you don't get a Linux file, we'll just do a DAC here. talk, right? DAC <laughs> talk about audio file shifts. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Start with Fourier transforms. And oh, oh, oh. Like, um, <laughs> have a room for audio engineers on the IRC is pretty good. So, good things about the Chromecast audio is it is kind of based on DLNA, which is kind of open source. Kind of an open, not really open source. Is Chromecast audio is it a speaker or is it a computer or is it a little of both or what? what like if I'm looking at it from like a consumer point of view, is it a, is it, yeah, that's I, can't, what, I can't tell what that is. Though it just it's like, the best it's three inches across. It 
has a power adapter, and you plug a headphone jack into it. And you could plug your headphones directly into it, although I don't think they would play very loud. Um, but you would then get a headphone jack, an RCA cable adapter, which is a very common audio adapter, and you would plug it in the back of your stereo. If you have powered speakers, you would get use the little cable that comes with it, which is a headphone to headphone, a mini headphone, three and a half millimeter headphone to three and a half millimeter headphone, and plug it directly into your powered speaker. It's a streaming receiver. It's a streaming audio receiver. Like this? It's a streaming audio receiver. Right. You, the way you would play music with it, if you're on Linux, you would fire up the Chrome, Chrome browser, because that's the only supported player for Linux. And you would go to some place you could stream audio through your Chrome browser, like my old EasyStream stream that was streaming around the house. And you would press play on it. You would go to the menu and choose cast from the menu. You would then point it at your Chromecast. But you needed an Android device to set it up because you need Google Home to configure these things. So that's a major downside that the only OS that is really supported for Chromecast is Android. And I guess Chrome OS by implication. Since that's basically Android. Uh, you have Google Home available to you on your Chromebook, right, Keith? Since we're in the uh, Actually, it's not. I'm, you're in guest mode now, but that's no. true. You can, you can um, install Download Android. it and install it. Yeah. Yep. You, go, you get the Play Store app on the Chromebook, and you can start Android apps now. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, Chromebooks would, I did not directly experiment, but I would expect them to work pretty well, too. Um, so Google Chrome doesn't have Google Home, it has to be Android? It's, the Google Home app is the only thing that will fully talk to your Chromecast. Mm -hmm. You need it for configuring them. You can, well, you can sort of set them up through a web interface, but you need, if you're going to play with Chromecast, you need at least one Android device that you can run Google Home off of. Just for configuration stuff. And I think those, you can also group them together, right? You can have groups. The grouping feature is awesome, and it's unique. I've not seen other, I was looking at open source DLNA implementations, and that's unique. Other, we're jumping ahead, but when I was looking at open source DLNA, I stopped looking at it when I figured out that everything was one to one. That there was no, the things that would generate and control DLNA devices had no way of, that I could discern easily from reviewing the documentation of saying I want to send to several targets and the open source receiving stuff didn't have a way of telling a bunch of devices that if somebody's trying to send to this other alias, which is what the grouping fe feature is, go play that. Right. Yeah. Uh, so another con of these things is they're, they, even though they're based on DLNA, they're proprietary extensions. So if you're trying to intermix them with uh, an open source Avaki implementation, uh, you might run into issues with things being implemented off standard or a feature that's not available, like the grouping feature might not be available if you're trying to use something that's standards oriented. So, uh, there is a Pulse Audio DLNA utility, which is very easy to get streaming to your Chromecast, which actually makes Linux better supported than Windows. But I found it to be kind of rough around the edges and had a huge problem is that every time a track switched, there would be like a kind of a, like a one second sample out of place of one of the tracks, and it was a very annoying audible artifact. Um, but the biggest, objection to the Chromecast is that even when I got the Ethernet adapter add-on to get onto the wired network and off the wireless, they still constantly dropped out on me. So you're listening to music, the thing drops out for a couple of seconds and then comes back. So for me, 
this was an absolute not acceptable. If I can't get past the dropouts, can't use the thing. Okay. Can yeah. I add one other thing? Uh, and they had an issue with these. They were interfering with Wi-Fi. What? These were interfering with Wi-Fi routers for a bit. Uh, uh, that's quite possible. Yeah. Maybe they they had the dropped out. They when they get on the when they when you set them up, well, they create they, they go through an ad hoc network and you kind of got to grab them off the ad hoc network that they create yeah. in order to configure them, which I wasn't thrilled with. <coughs> kind of don't like things creating unmonitored ad hoc <laughs> networks in my space. <laughs> but they were designed so somebody who does not understand what they're doing can fire up Google Home and configure them. So yeah. trade off. It's dirty, but it works. Well, what's the use case when dropouts are acceptable? I don't get it. <laughs> no. Government work? But, uh, small networks where you know you only got a six inches of wire? I don't know. But I found that and I, I other people have not had as bad a problem. So some people have complained about the dropouts and some people haven't. So it may just be the individual Chromecast you have. Some of them drop out more than others. They're a $30 piece of hardware and they do pretty sophisticated stuff. They're maybe cool. you got a clone uh what? Maybe you got like a clone of a Chrome of a Google Chrome uh, Chromecast audio. Uh, so let's look at oh, some other saying, solutions. Kind of, okay, that's right. It took me a second to do. So I the kind of classic one is to do a multi-room wired installation. The picture I have up on the screen, without installation, those guys go for about fifteen hundred dollars, uh, and then come in four or eight room configurations. I'm not sure if that's the four or the eight price, um, but. The hardware is expensive, plus you're running a lot of wire. Somebody installs that for you, you're probably looking to do four rooms. With the pulling of wire, you're probably looking at four to six grand to get that installed. Plus, see that nice app? Well, when the future generation of that thing comes up, where the company goes out of business, that app may no longer be installable at some point in the future. And you're then upgrading, but at least you get to reuse the wire if you go for the same kind of system. And each room has this big modern looking controller, you know, kind of like a big thermostat on the wall, which you may not want. Uh, more classic, simpler, you get a big ass amplifier, you put it in one place, you run cables everywhere, and you put these kind of dimmers in your wall. That will last you a long time. That's reliable. You're still running a lot of speaker wire all over your house. Uh, you're still going to spend, if you don't do that wiring yourself, a couple thousand dollars spent having people pull the wire. But that is a solid solution. Yes? Don't you start losing some of the highs after about 50 feet of speaker wire? No. 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 You can go more than 50 feet before you have degradation if you're using a, an appropriate gauge speaker wire for the amount of audio output you have. Okay. Um, I mean, I know that there's some real fanatics who are like, oh, you got to use gold-plated cables and that. But I don't believe the amount of loss over a run of 100 feet is really measurable. <coughs> and, and Keith yep. probably knows this better than I. Seems and don't forget, audio files is right. gold-plated, cryogenically treated cables. Yes. And is Monster running ads again? Yeah, I was, and, and the whole time John Pitt's thinking he's old Monster commercials from the and, and I will guarantee yes. you that a, a bunch of classical musicians, people with all kinds of audio meters will not be able to tell the difference between that really expensive cable mm -hmm. and 28 cent a foot radio shack cable yeah. of yeah. the appropriate gauge. You, you, they'll spend $4,000 in wire and $200 in speakers, so right. it's a moot point. But the answer right. is. And it's all late. The cost of the wiring is the labor. Um, right. Exactly. The, <coughs> the hot, fancy cables have make very little difference on the 
Mm -hmm. The main wow. reason why I'm saying that is because in audio recording for a guitar cable, if it's over uh, 50 feet, they have found roll off for it, but it's right. a passive pickup. Right, you're probably much lower voltage than it's going through the yeah. The, um, the big, is one of the, at least one of the big commercial solutions to this problem is Sonos, right? Yes, and I'm going to get to that. You're going to get to that. Okay. So, very next slide. Thank you all. <laughs> so, Sonos is very proprietary and it's not cheap. But it does work. It's simpler than the wired everywhere because it'll go wireless, it'll use wired. So it's kind of flexible, but it's expensive and proprietary. Um, and we're into open source, and uh, we're not loving expensive and proprietary at the same time. The next thing to really look about that, which is another long-standing, <coughs> older technology solution, is Whole House FM. Now, it absolutely would work. If you have a regular receiver everywhere, which is what I did, it would work. But there's actually quality problems with Whole House FM. First off, the power level that it operates at is very low. And while FM's caught low noise because a stronger signal overrides a weaker signal, your whole house FM is such a weak signal to begin with is that it may not always override the noise floor. So secondly, there's a limited dynamic range on the FM signal. And when you have music sources with different volumes, you have to set your whole house FM for the loudest stuff you play but your quieter stuff is now going to be dropped down to the noise floor. And so in addition to the annoyance of having to adjust the volume periodically is if, when you go with something that's mastered too hot to something that's mastered cold, as people in the audio industry call the two extremes, the thing that's cold when you raise the volume, you're now going to be hitting the noise floor and the dynamic range limitation of the FM, and it's not going to sound that good. Um, so, while it's inexpensive and it works, it's not, there's a definite audio quality issue with it. So then we already jumped ahead earlier. There's just building something on DLNA and Amahi, which, uh, from what I can see in other open source projects, uh, Ha are able to do anything that is equivalent to Google's Chromecast grouping feature. And I was going to be playing a lot, spending a lot of time playing under the hood to figure out how to make something like this work. And I'm just not that interested in the protocol to spend all that brain power to actually grasp it well enough. So I moved on. So. Uh, Keith has suggested I look at VLC and MPEG streaming, which work, they do. RT, they will generate an RTP stream and you can get things to listen to them. But they both only stream one file at a time. <laughs> which means that if you're trying to play a playlist... You're right back where you started. Exactly! <laughs> <laughs> so, interesting, but they didn't work. Next up, which is a major improvement on my first solution, is internet radio DJ software. <clears throat> the problem is that what appears to be out there in the open source space, at the very least, it looked like I was going to spend a few days before I got it to work. And if I was, yes, you've got to. Yeah, I was just going to say, did you ever try Winamp and uh, Wine? Winamp and Wine. <coughs> no. I generally find that wine crashes a lot, so I tend to stay away from things that require it or fire up Windows. I was going to say, because they have an awesome IceCast plugin, and I mm. used that in college, it was perfect. Mm. But it did have the buffering issue that you were talking about before. Yeah. Could you say so, that there's something cleaner like uh, 
play on Linux rather than straight white? He's getting to it. Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to get. So I've got through everything that didn't work. <laughs> An exhaustive overview of the solutions, or at least the types of solutions, that might or might not do the job, but generally with some major drawback. So the question that was burning me is, why can't we just capture the virtual sound card and make the thing stream? <laughs> and I could not find a simple answer with lots of Googling for questions around this concept. But after giving up on all of these other things, and hearing Keith talking about Jack, I started to look into the Linux sound architecture. And that led me to the two key components, Jack and Pulse Audio. And so now I'm going to introduce you to the Linux sound architecture. So there's been a bunch of components over the years. The Jack and Pulse Audio are sound servers, which are kind of higher level functions. And at the lower level, you have the open sound system, the enlightened sound daemon, and a predecessor of sorts to Pulse Audio is ALSA. ALSA's been, the ALSA project's deprecated itself in favor of Pulse, and the Linux kernel only supports the enlightened sound daemon directly, although uh, the OSS project is not dead, it's released things that hasn't deprecated itself in favor of what's clearly its successor. Well, like, well, like OSS is still like, you know, like in, in certain, in like kind of a certain form, it's still, well, one, it, it still releases code like independently, it's not in the Linux kernel, but two, it's actually, it's actually still used on the BSDs and probably even, probably Right, even so, BSDs. and it's, <coughs> the dominant uh, lower level driver is the inline sound, sound name, but OS is not dead. And uh, you'll uh, see that uh, the higher level servers, Pulse and Jack, both are able to support both OSS and the ESD. So, ALSA is kind of the main low-level driver for anything audio-related on a Linux system today. And I'm not going to leave the whole slide for you. I'll let you guys take a moment to read it. Hmm. Uh, I have a, yes? So you said that ALSA is deprecated? No, OSS is deprecated oh. on, the, on the Linux side. So. Uh, there's some still some support for OSS in most distributions, but the Linux kernel interfaces directly with also, but not with OSS. You said that Pulse was going to replace also. No, that was the Enlightened Sound Daemon. Uh, Pulse is a Pulse was actually designed to actually be a drop-in replacement for ESD, like the like. Interface level, like the like whole right. trade, like drops in replacement. So, also is like you've got a microphone, you need to write a driver that will work with Linux kernel. That's also. You've got uh, some kind of DSP DSP on your board that's going to be that produces outgoing sound that's going to be driven by also. All of your hardware drivers are pretty much also drivers. Yes. So uh, I've played with Windows Sound a little bit. Would this be like a uh, Linux equivalent to say ASIO for all? Are we in the same? What? Many guitar people. I, I know of ASIO. Yeah. That's. Are, are we in the same ballpark? I think. Um, 
Yeah, because those are interfaces into the OS. I'm, I'm not quite sure how it maps. Somewhere between here and Jack. And right, because Jack, I think, is, is more similar to... Uh, yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about Jack. Just for the latency. Okay. Uh, a couple, uh, like on the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> so, also is your low-level support hardware interfacing to your hardware device layer of support for all your sound stuff. So it's an abstraction of the hardware? Yes. So everybody can talk, everybody knows how to talk also and doesn't need to know very much about the device underlying it. Also, you write your also driver for your device, which like knows if it's a, uh, if it makes sound or if it inputs sound, uh, knows what its specs are, what modes it can do, and your driver Let's that be exposed to also, so that other things that use sound on the system only need to know how to talk to also. So the piece that puts things together is a sound server. So you have like a bunch of things that do stuff with sound at the hardware level that are accessed through also. And you need to route your application to the sound card. You need a different application that's going to listen to your microphone. And your sound server is going to put that all together and direct the traffic. And there are two, predominantly two sound servers, Jack and Pulse Audio, which play nicely together. The developers make sure that, because they actually are oriented towards accomplishing different objectives. So Jack, if you're doing something like home, running a recording studio on your Linux box, is oriented towards implementing your virtual patch panel. So you have a whole bunch of things that input sound, and you've got sound cards, and you need to patch one thing into your application, and then patch out into an effects box, and then come back in, and jacks your digital patch panel for doing that. Pulse Audio provides the API and hardware abstraction layer, including network hardware, which is the thing that I was looking to figure out for months. Pulse Audio, while not well advertised, is actually very network oriented. Enlightened sound daemon? What? Enlightened sound daemon? <laughs> right, that was the older thing that Pulse basically replaced. Was that from, I think, the Enlightenment window manager? Yes. I think yeah. it yeah. grew yeah. out of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, one of the interesting things about Pulse is that it's a user space daemon. Uh, and you can control it through GUI utilities. Frequently, your desktop environment has sound controls that will actually interface with Pulse, and it's got a whole bunch of command line utilities. Now, the interesting thing is, depending on how you configure it, it writes to different configuration files in a different format. And in case you didn't know, the creator of Pulse Audio was Leonard Fodor. Is that System D? Yes, yeah, the guy yeah. who wrote System D. Yeah. First he pissed off the Linux world with Pulse Audio, then, then he made System D. Right. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it's so he, wrote, he yeah. made something that's wonderful, but has really bizarre flaws. Like, <laughs> if you're configuring it from the GUI, why not just take the extra step of having the GUI configurations write 
to your regular doc pulse audio configuration files in your home directory. Because when you try to configure something from the command line, you're going to write to the configuration files in your dot pulse home directory, or you're going to sudo to root and do them system wide because you want them to apply system wide. And you have so three layers of configuration files, two of which are absolutely confusing. The one you configured from the GUI, which is buried somewhere under GCOF, and I don't even know where it is under KDE. <laughs> and the ones that are in dot pulse in your home folder, why not just have the two that are in the same format and know that it reads the system one first and then it reads yours so if there are any values conflict that the user's one wins. Um, just a decision that... It makes sense to me, but okay. It makes sense to me. <laughs> Yeah, and then, then you'll want it all in one spot, and you get a system D, and you're like, but that's not the Unix way. So, yeah, just go ahead. <laughs> yes, sir. Please, sir, you had another question. Yeah, I, I might be too high level here asking, but does it treat uh, UEFI and MBR installs the same way in how it addresses the hardware? No, that's, that's not relevant. Yeah, that's not relevant. Yeah, not relevant. relevant. Okay, because I've run into a lot of different issues with sound drivers where it won't play nice depending on which way you did it. That sounds like it's a hardware or a distro or, or desktop uh, environment yes. issue. That it's not a pulse audio issue, it's a hardware or a driver issue. Okay. You know, like I said, it might not have been the right place for that question. Yeah. No, 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 no. Or it could relate to the fact that it could be the configuration file buried within KDE and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Hmm. Now, this is a nice, pretty nice diagram of all the kinds of stuff the Pulse is handling, and there's a lot of pieces. And I give Leonard lots of credit for making something that works and frequently just works right out of the box. Uh, that you almost never have to configure unless you're actually trying to use one of the more obscure features. Like I was. Uh, yeah, I did. <laughs> so, if you post this image, like a link to it, in the mailing list, that would be awesome. It's just tiny enough, and the projector is blurry enough. You can't handle it. So, right. Well, the whole slide deck is online, and yeah, that'll it work. Was, uh, the image was borrowed from Red. Where did I? Put it? <coughs> yeah, right. Uh, the diagram on the next slide comes courtesy of Red.com because I stole their slot, their image, and I had to give them credit somewhere. Um, so Pulse Audio has some terminology. The server is the Pulse Audio daemon. And if you have multiple users on a system, it's running in user space, and everybody gets their own instance of the daemon. Uh, thankfully, in most places you're running Pulse, you don't normally have two people on the computer at the same time. So it's not really a problem, but it is a hypothetical problem uh, that and the, the client is the application sending data to Pulse via one of its several supported APIs or emulations. Well, did you have a question or are you no, just no, no. Sources are things that generate <coughs> The device generating the sound generally handled by also. The front end is the application that lets you interact directly with Pulse and modules. Pulse has lots of features implemented for a modular architecture, which is kind of a very Unixy way to do things. So when you want to communicate with Pulse Audio, uh, there's a couple of graphical utilities that are standard Pulse utilities that you'll probably use if you're in a regular desktop environment and you probably won't really need to get into the command line stuff unless you're trying to do something like a headless device. But for when you do that, there are a 
couple of utilities. There's the PACMP and the PACTL utility, and PACMB seems to be currently the favored one, but they're still supporting developing PA control. So I find that PA control is frequently a little terser in its output, which usually means that if its output has what you're looking for, it's easier to find the bit of in. So this is PA control. Uh, a command to just list some stuff about. Ooh. So now that we've seen the pieces and we know that Pulse has real network support, Leonard Puttering also wrote the Linux Avaki driver. And but PulseCast has always had a simpler RTP streaming net mechanism, which is all we need. So if you were trying to get Pulsecast and Chromecast to work together, you might be able to do it by invoking the Yavahi support that's baked into Pulsecast. Or there are other DLNA-based devices that will stream sound that you could conceivably take my solution look specifically into that and get those other devices working by using the built-in Navahi support. Okay. Uh, John, quick question. Is is this built into the Raspberry Pi or did you load something to get When you this? load Pulse Audio, yes. So, so this in the has... recipe I'll show you what packages you need okay. to install if you're using Raspbian or anything mm -hmm. that's similarly very Debian-ish. Gotcha. So if you're an Arch guy, you'll have to go figure out the equivalent packages. What? Well, I've already figured it out. Yeah, it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy enough. That's fine. So now we are going to start on our recipe for building one of these little guys. Please tell me it's an Ansible script. <laughs> what? I'm hoping it's Ansibleized. So, Damn. the first thing you want to try and do is get Linux to Linux Pulse going. If you've got two computers running Linux, you can use this to make, without before you invest in the, a device, you can just take two Linux computers, one of which is connected to a stereo, or could be any kind of audio that you want. And you can install some packages. So assuming you're running a GUI, um, there's probably a KDE equivalent to that if you're running KDE. Uh, you probably don't want the GCONF module, you want the KDE equivalent on KDE. And get these things installed and you're ready to go. Then you need to set a few things on the source computer, not a lot. The Pulse Audio kind of amazed me at how little configuration it needed to do something that is kind of advanced. So you just click the right two boxes, and I'll post a link to the slides, and I'll also post a link to that original large diagram. And then, right away, as soon as you close that, you open up Pulse Audio's volume control utility. You see you've got a new device. You can have your music player pick that device. And then when you're browsing the internet and some impolite porn site pops up, it's not going to blow your speakers out. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, John, in the slide before, you turn on the multicasting, right? So what you, yeah, enable. Okay, so enable multicast sender. This is on the source. You said this is a source machine, right? Yeah, we're working on the source computer okay. that's generating the sound right now. Gotcha. Okay. And you're using PA Press to do that. Ah, okay. And then you go over to after you do that, you go over to 
to the line control utility, PAVU control, and you can see your devices there. Right. It's ready. Now you need to go to your receiving end, pull up the GUI, and click a couple, like four more boxes. And now you're ready to receive. So you need to enable the receiver. Uh, and enable it to be exposed on the network. So is your Raspberry Pi the server, or do you have a client for each uh, stereo? We'll get to that. Right now I'm saying let's do, since we probably have two Linux desktops, and we can use the GUI, start your first practice run, just do two Linux desktops, or a Linux desktop and a Linux laptop, whatever you have. Just get this thing working, prove that it works. And then we'll move on to doing it. OK, doing so I could even do this between two desktops, set one up as the server where my right, we're audio using, is. We are using standard Linux sound architecture. And all the ARM devices to compile it and having the binaries ready for you in their distros. Exactly. So in the end, it's just a network protocol. So one broadcast, one you know, receives, and that's it. Well, or multiple receives in this case. Yes, exactly. So we can do a practice run with the GUI on the desk on regular desktops and laptops, whatever we have handy, and we can get one connected to something that will output sound. We can use one to generate a signal and prove that we can stream sound across the room. Except you're using a Chromebook. <laughs> I'm sorry? Except you're using a Chromebook right now. Well, I'm doing this presentation <laughs> on a Chromebook. I'm just giving you grief. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> All right. Uh, it's unfortunate, then, Keith. In VLC, it's that easy to switch to the virtual sound card we just created. And now you can play stuff in VLC, and the sound will come out the other computer. You can play videos in VLC, but there will be some buffering delay, and the sound won't be synchronized. It doesn't work that well. Mm. There's probably some settings that you can twiddle around with to try and eliminate buffering, to try and get that synced up. But I was primarily interested in uh, yeah. audio uh, in this case, and didn't really spend time seeing if I could get the buffering minimized. I generally want buffering because it, if there's any interruptions on the network, it gives it a better chance to recover. Uh, is there Pulse Network Protocol, is it UD? I'm assuming it's UDP. It's not, t it's not TCP, is it? It's based on RTP, which is using uh, broadcast reserve block addresses. Okay. It's probably UDP, but I actually didn't. I didn't see that much explaining. Yeah, I didn't sure. delve it's into it. It's using RTP and whatever RTP uses, and I guess we really should. I should know the answer to that next time I give the presentation. Yeah, plain RTP is is UDP. Okay, then it's using... Okay. Which would make sense. Yes. Right, for audio and video, it should be UDP. For sandboxing purposes, could I use a VM as the source? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely for the source, but for the receiving end, yeah, you probably want something that, that right. has a physical connection to a satellite. Right. Like but on the same machine, can I send from a VM? For the... Setting it up and play at yes, that should I, absolutely work. I, I would Just say even for the, the logic. Right? Yes, so you don't even need two computers if you want to run one of if you want to run the center and virtual machine. That should work. Just and, but also remember, for a client, you can pass through your audio device to your VM. So in a VM, this would work as well. Yeah, right. But you actually want you actually want to make sure you're doing it through the Pulse network feature and not through right. the VM feature. Yes, right. So now if you want to go look at the configuration files that you created, you have to go there, which is buried a bit. And then when you open up each of the component 
GCONF XML files. The regular Pulse Audio configuration commands are wrapped in XML tags. It couldn't have been that much extra code for Pulse Audio to just write to your .pulse audio equivalent <coughs> file using the native Pulse Audio. A minor detail, but just like this is silliness. Why hasn't that bug been fixed in all these? Well, years? because obviously Leonard Coder doesn't see a problem. Yeah, he doesn't see a bug. Well, there's there's a whole community around this, so I'm hearing pull request. <laughs> but it's not so much a bug as a design decision. It's a feature. <laughs> yeah, it's a feature. Design decision. No, 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 I like his idea. Just fork it with just, just fork it with just that change. What? <laughs> Fork it oh, just with that change. I cannot <laughs> comprehend the source code, so I would not be the one to run a fork. Uh, have you heard of uh, Pipewire? I think that's like the next, uh, the, there's in the new Fedora, it's something that's supposed to swallow up uh, Pulse Audio and Jack and a bunch of things. Uh, What's no, it called? Pipewire? Pipewire. Pipewire. Yeah. I'll have to yeah. go check that out. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing for, yeah, people. So that's probably the fork for people that haven't been happy with Pulse Audio. And, oh, okay. and trying to simplify the stack is, you know, Pulse Audio also, you know, it's, it's a bunch of things. And so they're trying, another effort in trying to unify it. Uh, but that's, it's really recent, like that really just started this uh, six months ago, nine months ago, something like that. Oh, and yeah. Like, like Fedora point, 27. Happened. Even though this particular thing that we bumped into here is like, just a stupid design decision doesn't break anything. Right. It's once you like see that you've just got two set two possible sets of user configurations. Three if you run KDE, alternate between KDE and no. Okay. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's nasty part. <coughs> that it's just a design decision that most of us would it's not do. Right. We would have the main system configuration and then your user specific configuration and have all the utilities right to one of those two depending on the appropriate context. Well, why would this stuff be dependent on a window manager? Why couldn't you like run it on a server attached to your audio? Because each window manager handles audio a little bit different. The widgets and how it plugs in is a little bit different. Actually the the Windows Manager, or sorry, the Window Managers don't pre-package Windows Managers do. So if you roll a distro that doesn't have a pre-packaged Window Manager set up for you, in other words, not Ubuntu. Pulse <laughs> like Audio paper. runs independently of the Window Manager, but yeah. it's designed as a user utility. Mm -hmm. It's almost always started for you by your desktop environment. Right. So it's very works closely with the desktop environment. It just Having each desktop environment write a separate Pulse Audio configuration file right. instead of having everything that configures Pulse Audio yeah, go to so the, the question your is, user main configuration. Why, why does KDE have yet another location? Because GCOF, this is a known, That's a known thing. configuration location. So if you're running KDE, you're not going to use no configuration. You're going to use KDE configuration. They do that so that way when you install KDE, it doesn't combat or doesn't uh, conflict with any other configs. Right. That so that part makes each. That right. Is, yeah. That that, makes that part makes sense. But the sound server, this you know, break the layer independency. The sound server is is more or less a system thing. Even though it's it's user, there's some user additional pieces like you're saying once you configure it. It shouldn't matter what window right. manager you use. I don't want to have to reconfigure. If I yeah. switch between desktop environments, why do I have to reconfigure my sound system? Exactly, you shouldn't have in to. In each desktop environment, why not? Right. Since the sound system is separate from both desktop environments. Right. Why don't you just delete and soft link them all to one location? How would you do that between K and E? No, you can't do that. It's too difficult. Anyway, I'm not going to solve the problem. We're going to move on. Because we actually want to start building device now. Okay, let's build a device. So, to build one of these devices, and that's a picture of a nice clear case, uh, if you'd like to be able to see your components, 
you'll need a couple of things. You'll need a Raspberry Pi, they're about 30 bucks online or something like that. You'll need a micro SD card because that's what you need to boot a Raspberry Pi and put an OS on it. I used, and obviously you can fix the recipe to your heart's content because there are several competing pieces of hardware out there that do something similar. The Hi-Fi Berry DACs are popular for people who want better sound than what's built into the Raspberry Pi, which is pretty low-end sound. Um, if the card works in other single board computers, so if what in fact you're like a beagle gut bone guy or you want to spend more and do a Intel or AMD single board computer, uh, these things will work on many of those other <coughs> models as well. Um, there are two main products you want to look at, the DAC Plus and the DAC Plus Pro. Uh, the differences are small, the Pro has gold-plated contacts which may over time hold up better than the non gold plated contacts. And it's got its own clock generation, mm -hmm. which is probably a little more reliable than the Raspberry Pi's clock generation. But at different times when I was buying the, when I was building them, the pros were out of stock unless I wanted to wait for them to come from Switzerland and pay all the shit for the postage. Mm. So, I ended up going mostly with the DAC Plus, except for the first one when wearing on a Pro. Um, if the Pros are available, I would say, yeah, spend the extra few bucks for the Pro, but that's up to you. Uh, there are a couple other Raspberry, there are a couple other products from these guys. There's a board with integrated amp, so if you're trying to build like a tabletop player, you would want to look at the board with the integrated amp, but the DAC in that isn't as good as the one. Is, uh, one of the reasons I chose the Hi-Fi Berry DAC Plus slash Pro is they're using a Burr Brown chip, and a lot of audiophiles like Burr Brown better than the other brands. Um, uh, So uh, I wouldn't say this is going to match like a high-end DAC you put spent five hundred or thousand dollars on, uh, but it's definitely better sound output than uh, the Chromecast. And the guy who's got a weird hearing aid, as you may have noticed, can hear the difference between what comes out of a Chromecast and what comes out of a better sound card or uh, one of these devices with the Hi-Fi Berry DAC. And if your hearing's better than mine, I assume you'll hear more difference than I do. Now, <laughs> uh, the next thing you'll need is to download an operating system. If you're a beginner, I'm recommending the uh, Raspberry Raspbian Noobs installer, which will get you pretty easily, other than the fact that you have to connect a keyboard and mouse to it, will get you through setting up the thing. Uh, so, to set up your Pi, you're going to format your micro SD card as FAT32, uh, G part head, easy to do it with. You'll download and extract your noobs. Copy the extracted noobs folder onto your SD card. Attach your peripherals and network to your Raspberry Pi device. And put the micro SD card into the little bit on slot that the first time I was setting it up took me a little while to find the actual SD card slot. Um, it happens. And you boot the thing. 
you'll pick the minimal Raspberry you install because you don't want the GUI. You, we're setting these up to run headless. And in fact, if you're installing a bunch, you're going to read the instructions on how to install a Raspberry Pi headless and skip the uh, noobs and just install Raspbian. Or uh, if you're an Arch guy, the equivalent Arch thing. Or if you're a Red Hat Fedora CentOS guy, the equivalent. <coughs> but wait, I thought we need to use um, GUI, or, or at least your instructions had using GUI stuff for part That of was stuff. for the Linux to Linux setup. We were just doing it the easy way. Oh, okay. Um, right, right. So yeah, this is that a nice headless. So that was like, I want to get this working. You can use the GUI tools. You can do it easy. Right. Now we're going to do it the hard way. Right, right. <laughs> okay, that answers my question. You don't need all that GUI stuff. Now. But you have to jump through a few extra hoops because you're not using the GUI. What, what's the longevity of a micro SD used like this? A, a what? What's the longevity of a micro SD used like this if you're using it all? You're not doing. I my can operation. answer that. Yeah, I can answer that too. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you want to know specifically with the Raspberry Pi, as long as your power supply doesn't suck, it's going to last a while. I have a Raspberry Pi that's been running with. Only reboots when I feel like it. Been running for about seven years now, or sorry, six years now. And the read writes are just normal. Yeah, I know the read writes are, are there because most of uh, it's Linux. Once it's loaded into RAM, it's not really going to do anything. Uh, and doing what IO we're doing, we're not saving any data, data so yeah. it's very little reason to write the SD card. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not using that much RAM, so it's not like it's going to swap all. Right. What about our log? It just gets slow. So yeah, so. Or well, you log rotate and dump it. Bar log in a RAM disk. Um, you know what? That's something you should look at. Well, I should actually look at this. Check <laughs> bar log. Hey, I only got these yeah. set up fairly recently. I, so I can. Have one it doesn't do caching. It doesn't like. Doesn't. Is it? So it's just. It's, it's all real time. It's not doing any caching at all of the. Yeah. The data that's There's some caching in memory. Right. Nothing to disk though. Nothing, nothing no. And actually, to answer your question, my Raspberry—I have a Raspberry Pi B Plus that's hooked to a webcam that watches the front of my house. It's been on for three years straight. Yeah. I think I've had one problem. I thought was with the card, and it—it it, it wasn't. Just I had a weird power outage, and there was some issues, but the card was fine. Yeah. And it was wow. like a regular Class A or Class Ten card. Yeah, mine's a Raspberry Pi Plus as well. That's just still yeah, chugging still, along. Yeah. yeah. And that's with, and it's writing every two seconds, it's writing a frame. And it's wow. been doing that for th two and a half, almost three years now. Do you yeah. write to that card or do you write to something else? I write to the card. Wow. The same card with the OS? Yeah. Same card, same OS, same everything. I'm beating the hell out of the thing. <laughs> the, the, the Raspberry Pi, once it starts loading stuff into RAM, it's, yeah. it, it can really, it, as long as there's no memory leaks, you're good. But you say what well, it's car wing. I'm just saying that yeah. that's I'm I'm writing yeah. a frame of seven twenty by what whatever yeah. the six forty so, by so whatever. The micro SD cards can handle quite a few writes. Yeah, I'm, I would say they're yeah. designed to be abused. Remember, they're designed yeah. to be like streaming four K yeah. audio. If you get like a class ten UHC, mm -hmm. oh, and that's a video now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's like a. And you're do, hardly like doing any writes gigs. except what's probably going to our log. Yeah. Which, even if there's a corruption on the VAR log, you almost never look at the logs, who cares? Yeah. Hey, wait, wait, no. wait, CJ looks at the logs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the first place I look when I don't understand why it doesn't work. That is your question. You got hacked by So one. now you've got this thing built, you rebooted it. You show what you said to log. You log in. The default username and password with Raspbian, or Pi and Raspberry, pretty easy. Remember, you're going to want to get your MAC and IP address because since you may want to SSH into this in the future, you'll want to set a fixed IP on it, either by DHCP or setting a static IP. What about using Avahi to do broadcast? Mm -hmm. That is outside the scope. <laughs> a feature set that I've mentioned is supported. No, 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 just for broadcasting IP. You don't have to use the streaming protocol of it. Um, yes, I guess that could be set up, but why? It's pr pretty easy when you're setting it up to get the MAC address and put it in your DHCP server, and you'll know what IP address it has. So, um, yeah. 
Then you need to run raspy config. First thing you want to do is change the password to whatever your personal default password is. Password. So at least somebody, some stranger that wants to monkey around your house who doesn't know that, won't be able to just get into your audio devices and, and run muck with them. Um, you'll set a host name and you'll enable SSH. And it's a good time to update the system. App get update, app get upgrade, and then you need to then you need to get to the hard stuff. So you need to enable the sound card, and this is if you use a different manufacturer's sound card or some future generation or one of the alternate ties from the same maker. It maybe slightly different than this, but at least if you choose the sound part I chose, you can follow, you don't need to go figure out what you need to do to enable it. So, first thing you'll do is disable the built-in sound, because you're never going to use it. Then you need to add the line that tells the Raspberry Pi what sound card driver to use. And then, finally, I disabled some stuff I wasn't using. Since I'm using Ethernet, there's no reason to have Wi-Fi on. However, if you're going to use these things over Wi-Fi, you'll need to branch out and look at the Wi-Fi configuration and actually have the Wi-Fi on. And maybe you want to disable the Ethernet because you're not using it. Um, Then, what does whole dash p do? That is shut down. So you want to shut down. You want to unplug everything. You want to remove every USB thing because one of the now problems with the Raspberry Pis, which is why some people like big old bones or spending the big bucks and getting a regular Intel AMD single board computer is that even the third generation Raspberry Pis, the USB and the network, get into contention for resources. So the best way about that is to simply not have anything connected to USB at all. Then there's never anything generated by a USB, thus no contention, no problem. Except for network. What? Except for network. But that's what we want to go through. So only the network is going through, but it's not getting into a fight with the USB controller yeah. over a limited bandwidth. So you're not going to get dropouts because your cat decided to walk on your keyboard. So once you've done that, you'll SSH back into it, which will confirm that you actually set up SSH and reserved your IP and all, did all that good stuff properly. And you're going to install a couple of utilities. And you'll notice we're installing Screen because Pulse is a user space game. And even though it supports a system mode, I found that system mode didn't work. And system mode is kind of like the documentation says don't ever use system mode. Did you but try that with did you try that with system D or did you try to use like some init compatibility? <laughs> I just tried to get the thing running in system mode any damn way I could. Okay. And it would never respond answered, thank you. To <laughs> any th thing trying to send audio to it. So now you're gonna want to create a script. You need to start pulse script. And that's this is what goes into it. It's a fairly simple command. Starting pulse off the command line. You're using the start flag, which is nice because it checks to see if pulse is running. And if pulse is running, it exits gracefully. The other command that will start pulse will actually 
think it fail if pulse is already running. So you want to use start instead of the other uh, command to start pulse up. And you don't want dynamic module loading. Your module should be loaded at start and in your configs. And then uh, you create a second one to reload pulse, which basically just kills all your pulse processes with pkill. And just an FYI, it's 9.08. Yeah, we're running a little over. We're close to the end. Okay. But then you need to go configure pulse, and you're going to manually put it equivalence to what you've discovered with the GUI. So uh, you guys can read the. So you have to edit a couple of config files. And then, for simplicity, although you can almost certainly spend some time getting this to work with systemd, I just put it in RC local. And what the pulse, the start pulse script does is it runs in a loop. You may notice there's a loop here. So all it does is starts pulse, goes to sleep for 60 seconds. So when we put that in RC local, you then have a process that's going to stay running because we're running it off of screen, which is how you get to a user session before anybody logs in. So screen will start your session running as your default Pi user. You can get fancier and create another user, but since it's a single purpose device, having the default user run it seems well enough to think. And then, mixing up, we have a minor issue to fix, which is over time, because the clocks on the pies aren't perfect. And I did not notice this as being as much of a problem with desktops, which mm -hmm. probably have more accurate clocks in them. Mm -hmm. Watch. They'll drift out of sync. So when you turn everything on, everybody's in sync, it's awesome. But like a month later, it's like one of them, what's this one playing 11 seconds? Behind the other. <laughs> you don't run NTP on them? Probably. I would run Crony. Yeah. Or something like that? They're by default current versions of Ubuntu set something up to run NTP. I could look into that. But we'll go. No. Next. Um, Let's finish this up. Uh, it's a buffering delay, so I don't think that fixing the system time would fix the buffering delay, which is why I said, why don't I just restart the process? At some time, I'm, I'm unlikely to be listening. So all you do is have a cron job that kills it. Your job that started it loops for 60 seconds. So within a minute, that job is going to hit the top of its loop and restart pulse for you. Uh, so all you need to do in your cron tab is kill it so that it can be restarted by your process that's there to make sure a pulse is always running. So that's all working. The client I'm using is Clementine, which is an open source music player. This is a picture of Clementine running. And one of the cool things about Clementine is that even though it's not very active in development right now, it's not dead. And the developers added a remote for Android. Ooh, nice. So nice. on my phone, oh. I can connect <laughs> to Clementine. Oh, that's I can control it. Yes. So yes. with my old solution, I had to go run back upstairs, adjust my playlist, restart everything, run over to every computer, you just outdid refresh the browser, yeah. I just get on my phone and... You just outdid Chromecast. Yeah. What? You just outdid the Chromecast at its own game. Yes. Or out of anything. I mean, yeah. the, next, the only thing that looks as good is uh, the controller for Cody. And then you're back to, I mean, which may be interesting yeah. to see if that can work with this, but so, that's awesome. Anyway, yeah, let's see. Next slide, let's finish. I've tinkered okay. together using the Linux sound system and a music player that I happen to like that added a nice new feature done except for voice control 
which right now I'm not doing anything with voice control. I don't want to put microphones all over my house. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> so if I do anything with voice control, it's going to be when there's something that I can run locally in my house that will interface with my open source stack. And I'm going to guess that that's probably two or three years down the road before we see anything that really works. That's, and basically we're done.